idea here is that if a mosquito starts feeding on you, unless you're sound asleep, you don't usually like that particular behavior. And so you shoo the mosquito away, and she flies off. And then she's, she's going to keep feeding until she's full. It's, it's like Thanksgiving dinner for mosquitoes. Until they're fully replete, until their stress receptors go off, they continue to feed. And so she flies off, and she either finds somebody else to feed on, or if there's nobody else available, she lands back on you. And so this tool is essentially taking human microsatellites and applying those to that blood meal we find inside mosquitoes. And these are the same microsatellites that are used as the genetic markers for paternity testing. So they're very diverse, and they tell us actually can define individuals very easily. And essentially what we're asking is, is that the contributor, contributor to that blood meal, is it just one person, or is it more than one person? Has that mosquito fed on just one person multiple times, maybe, or actually fed on one person, then flown over and fed on a second person? And we call this the, the multiple, um, multiple blood feeding index. Most importantly, that this also would suggest that these people that now are getting f fed on now are probably getting fed on maybe twice as much, maybe one and a half times as much. I don't really know what the number is, but these mosquitoes are now taking multiple bites off a much smaller part of the population. So a smaller part of the population is now at greater risk. But part of that population that's now at risk are also the ones that are donating parasite back to the mosquito population to, to propagate this infection to other people. And so this part of the population, if we can identify them, which is a hard thing to do, would be the part of the population we want to even protect more. What she was also able to illustrate quite clearly is that there's a lot of heterogeneity. And so before bed nets, we knew that about 20% of the population was contributing about 40% of the blood meals. And this is from those genetic markers that we were using. But after bed nets in place, that same 20% are now contributing 60% of, the pop, 60 of the blood meals. And that really reflects this again. It's, these are really correlative. Again, some households are hot and some aren't. We found that about 20% of the households before Bennett's were contributing about 74, 75% of blood meals. But now 90% of the blood meals are coming from that same 20% of households. So again, those mosquitoes are really getting focused on those people that are still exposed, that remain exposed, and that are not covered by the control measures we put in place. Another little piece of information that Samita was able to, to, to show us, and this is, um, has been submitted and hopefully will be uh, in press and published soon, was this idea of what we call fed mosquitoes. Now, all the fed mosquitoes and all the blood meal analysis I've been talking about all along was based off mosquitoes where we collected in the field, we looked at them, and we could see blood inside their abdomen. And we call those blooded mosquitoes or fed mosquitoes. And all the other mosquitoes, which we don't see blood in, we, we sort of put to the side. We don't use those for blood meal analysis usually. Uh, but Smita actually went through and she actually said, well, what actually happens to those mosquitoes? Do they actually have human DNA or host DNA in them? And so she actually assessed all of them using the molecular tools, both the, what we call the unfed and the fed mosquitoes um, from the field collections. And what she found was that actually a lot of those mosquitoes that didn't have any visible blood in them actually had evidence that they had bitten. Now, we know that human DNA or host DNA only lasts for about 60 hours in mosquito gut. It gets degraded actually quite rapidly as those mosquitoes take that blood meal and produce eggs out of that blood meal. And so it doesn't last very long. And so we know that the, any DNA, host DNA that we detect in mosquitoes is from a relatively recent host exposure. And what she was able to show is that, that we actually underestimate biting rate by not looking at those unfed mosquitoes by up to a, as much as 18%. Now, if you have very high transmission rates, like we do in Chilenge, underestimating by 18%, maybe not such a big deal. There's so much transmission, everybody gets malaria every year. So underestimating by even 18 or 20%, is, is sort of a drop in the bucket. But if you're in a situation where malaria transmission is pushed to, to the edge, where it's pre-elimination or are really, really just barely hanging on, missing the, the intensity of transmi transmission by up to 18% could be extremely significant, especially in terms of whether you implement control or whether you hold that resource back. Um, and more recently, and this is a paper that actually just came out, um, uh, authored by Tyler um, and many of our collaborators in Fairfax, we've been able to document the spillover of this pathogen from the original ticket came in with to other 
um, other ticks that, that live at the same site at the same time. So these are the dog tick that you're very familiar with, um, as well as some other ticks um, that this pathogen has now slipped over to. And it looks like it's there. It's probably there to stay. It's, uh, we found it in consecutive collections over at least two years and probably three years. And so not only an emergence event, but a spillover event. So that's a pretty exciting thing to do. And so that brings me back to past your second quote. And that's, that's really the idea that I, I don't feel that, that I can uh, in my work or have really separated the basic science from the applied science. I think they're inherently linked. And we can use one to inform the other. Um, and it goes both directions. We can use the field biology to, to help explain some of the things we see, see in the molecular world. And we can certainly use the molecular tools to explain what we see in the field. Uh, um, and it's an exciting area to work in, if not sometimes difficult and challenging, uh, certainly a, a wonderful place to work in.